Today we're going to be learning the Darim Daf Pechet. This is the Daf for Shabbat. We're going to start at the bottom of Pesayin Abubet. Quick review of the Mishnah. If somebody says, I know there's such a thing as Nidarim, but I didn't know that I can annul them, he's allowed to annul them. But if he says, I didn't know that it was a vow, then he, look, there's a machloket, a debate between Rabbi Meir and the rabbis. Rabbi Meir says he actually can't annul the Ned, nullify it. But now, the first part seems to indicate that Rabbi Meir doesn't disagree about if he knows that there's, there's vows, he just didn't know he can undo them, he's still allowed to undo them on the day he finds out that he's allowed to nullify the vow. So this contradicts, this is what we call partial knowledge is enough, okay? Or, sorry, partial knowledge doesn't mean anything. The fact that he knew part but didn't know the whole thing doesn't mean that he knew and Biyom Shamo basically gets pushed off. That contradicts a sugya in, about your miklat, about running to a refuge city. Below re'ot prat l'suma, devrei Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Meir, omer l'rabot et asuma. There's a debate about how to understand you were in you were in a place, you didn't see someone, and then you killed them. So what does it mean you didn't see? You could have seen them, but you didn't see them. And Rabbi Yehuda comes to say, which seems like the simple reading, which is a blind person who couldn't have seen wouldn't have to go to Yermiklat, wouldn't be punished. Rabbi Meir says even if he was blind, he still needs to go to Yermiklat because perhaps you could say seeing is right to feel. He sensed that the other person was there. Below Ra'ot could be understood more generally. Soon we'll see exactly where he gets this from. But the main point is that partial knowledge, knowing maybe there was someone there without actually seeing them and knowing exactly where they were, clearly a blind person can't tell exactly where they are. So therefore, that's enough for Rabbi Meir to be considered that you knew. So therefore, how could Rabbi Meir there say that a little bit of knowledge is as if you fully knew, and by us a little bit of knowledge is if you didn't know at all, and only beyond Shavon, when you find out everything, then you're you, then you can actually nullify it. So, um, right, that's when Biyom Shomo kicks in, only once you have full knowledge. So it seems to be a contradiction, even though they are a little bit different, but it seems to contradict. Amarava, starting from the beginning of our daf now, Pechet Amarava. Each place is taken in its own context, okay? Without getting into this, but Biyom Shomo by Neder, it's Beyom Shamo, it's when he knows that he is allowed. It's not only when he hears, but when he knows that he's he can nullify. And our ke- and the case of the Ir Miklat has to do with the context. Now, how does it do with how does it have to do with the context? So this is the world of Drashot. There's certain ways to of, of darshaning Psukim. And here there's two sections where Ir Miklat Refuge City is discussed. Again, it's someone who accidentally kills someone. And he has to go to this refuge city. Who gets to go, right? It's a punishment for them. It's also protection, but it's also a punishment. So who gets to go? Rabbi Yehuda Saval, Gabe Rotzeh When it comes to Ir Mikla, what does it say? Asher Yavot Re'eyu Bayar. This, by the way, is in Devarim chapter 19. Our pasuk we were quoting below Ra'ot is from Bamibar chapter 35. Those are the two sections that talk about this. This is the topic of uh, our skills classes, which are starting in a few weeks. Um, starting on Sunday, the 20, I should check to be exactly sure, but I think it's the 26th, we'll be starting, a, no, the 29th. Sunday, the 29th, we'll be starting skills class, and it will be specifically about Refuge City, very, very interesting topic. So anyway, Rabbi Yehuda says, which means anyone who comes into a forest, and then, right, he's using his axe and accidentally kills somebody, Kol devar okay? Uh, sorry, kol Anyone who potentially could go into the yard. Now, can a blind person go into a forest? Of course. V'sumanami bar me'aliyar. Okay, a blind person can go into the, the forest also. So from those words, you would assume that a blind person is included. However, v'i'amart b'lo ra'ot. L'rabot et hasuma. Now he says, this is Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yehuda says below ra'ot is to exclude the blind person. Now, if you want to say below Ra'ot is coming to include the blind person, which is what the other person is saying, Rabbi Meir, he says, You can already say we include the blind person from the Yar Pasuk, anyone who goes into the forest, which would include a blind person. So now, this is why I say the world of Drashot. That means that below Ra'ot is not necessary. Below Ra'ot, we would think, would be coming to teach us also a blind person, because as Rabbi Meir said, could potentially see because 
right? But there's no point. We don't need a drasha for that because we can already learn it from anyone who can go into a forest. That's a blind person. Therefore, Elish Mamina, Belorot, Prat Lesuma, Belorot, Mabs is coming to teach us something additional. What additional? Oh, by the way, we're going to exclude a blind person because he can't see at all. Okay? Because he can't see, Belorot, right? You didn't notice, but it has to be someone who could have noticed. And therefore, since Yar includes, and then we also have this Pasuk about not seeing, that must come to exclude. Because if one includes, the other must exclude. Rabbi Meir Sabal, so how's he going to explain this? Ktiv bivlidat, kol debar meida. Bivlidat, that's another pasuk. It says, if you didn't know, okay? Asher yaket re'eu bivlidat. This is also in, in Dvarim, Deuteronomy. So he says there, he says, you didn't know. Now, a blind person can't fully know because he can't see. So it has to be someone who really could know. Vesumar lav bar meidahu. He can't necessarily know that somebody's there because he can't see them. Maybe he can hear them, but maybe he didn't hear them. Maybe they were very quiet. Couldn't see them. I amart below ra'o prat l'suma. Now, if you're going to say below ra'o comes to exclude the blind person, mi blidat nafgalei. We already took it out from the blidat. Now, so now we have one saying no, and the other one saying no, right? No to assume it twice. Well, if you already learned it from one, now, in the other case, we included it, and then the other one came to exclude, because if one includes, the other one's excluded. Here we already excluded it. Now, there's a rule that if you have two exclusions, it actually comes as like a double negative. It comes to include. So therefore, it comes from Mary and says, Bivlidad excludes the Summa. Below Ra'ot also excludes the Summa, meaning the blind person. Therefore, below Ra'ot Lirabot the Tasuma. So the second time it appears, again, this actually is the first, it doesn't really matter which one, but right, there's no order in the Torah. The point is, the, the below Ra'ot comes to teach you even a blind person is included, okay? And that's how, that's, now the point being here, that don't question Rabbi Meir when it comes to Ir Miklat with Rabbi Meir when it comes to Neder, because each one depends on its context. And, and really in a simpler way, they're kind of saying the reason specifically by Ir Miklat is a unique halacha by Ir Miklat, and therefore by Refuge City, and therefore don't learn from here to a regular case, uh, you know, to our Neder case. New Mishnah. Somebody forbids their son-in-law to benefit from them. Okay, so let's say my father decides my, son, his, my husband, his son-in-law, is not going to benefit from him at all. Okay, means like no financial benefit. And he wants to give me money. Now what's the problem? The problem is that we're going to see, or there's actually a debate about whether any property that I get or any money that I get, it's called Yad Isha Ki Yad Ba'ala. It means that a woman in those days didn't really own things. Anything that she owns goes straight to her husband. That's Rabbi Meir's approach. The rabbis don't view it that way, don't view it as anything that comes to her goes immediately to her husband. They view it a little differently. Part of this has to do with things we learned in the Ketubah, that she gives her Masa Yadayim, her salary, and in exchange she gets Mizonot, and he takes care of all sorts of things, and that's why financially he gets her stuff. But Right? And there's all sorts of rules. You might remember this from Tubod about Mirce Malog, Mirce Tzom Barzel, different things where she has property. She maybe keeps the main part, but he gets the proceeds. It depends on which property. I'm not going to get into all those details. But Rabbi Meir's approach is to say, Yadi Shaki Yabala, which means anything you give the woman basically goes straight to the husband. So if my father wants to give me a gift, as soon as he gives it to me, it goes straight to my husband. If my husband can't benefit from him because the father vowed that my husband can't benefit from him, it's a problem. He can't actually give me a gift. So the Mishnah says, if he wants to give me money, what he says is the following. I'm giving you these as a gift. Number one, he has to say, as long as your husband gets no rights to them. Only what you get and put in your mouth. Meaning it'll be yours once you take the money, spend it on food and put it in your mouth. At that moment, it becomes yours. And the Ram basically says, why? Because if you say that, then when does it become hers? When it's in her mouth already. Now, the husband can't get rights to something while it's in her mouth. She's already swallowing it. So there's no rights to be given over at that point. It's in her mouth. And that's why this is the only way it would work according to the mission. To which Rav says in the Gemara, he says literally like the Mishnah. It's only if he says those words. Because if he doesn't say those words, 
But if he says, do with it whatever you want with this money, even though he says, your husband can't have any rights to this, the father is going to get rights. The Ron points out that there's a debate about whether there's a why there's there's more in between whatever you want to do with it and whatever goes in your mouth. The Ron, the way the Ron described it, as I said, is because it goes in her mouth, the f- the father the husband can't get any rights to it because she's already swallowing it. However, which would mean that let's say if it's closed, so the Ron says if it's closed, and he says I want you to buy yourself a dress with this, that dress is going to go into the domain of the husband and it will be an issue even though he's not, let's say, wearing a dress. But he says that other people disagree and say that since it's either what you put in your mouth versus whatever you want to do with it, there's something in between, which would also work. And that would be, you know, I'm giving you this to buy yourself a robe or to buy yourself a cover or to buy yourself something. If he's very specific about it, maybe that would work as well. Again, like I said, there's a debate. The Ron doesn't seem to think so, but he does quote others who think that that's the case. Another question, um, okay, let's go one more line and then we'll go back and add something else. Ushmuel Omer, Shmuel disagrees with Rav and says, Afilu amal lo Even if he says, do with it whatever you want, here's the money, I don't want your father, your husband to have rights to it, but do with it whatever you want, according to Shmuel that works. Why does Shmuel hold this? Some people think that Rav, okay, Rav is obviously agrees with Rabbi Meir, but who says, meaning her hand is like his. So anything she gets goes straight to the husband. But Shmuel holds like the rabbis, who don't hold the yadi shakiyabala, and that there's ways that a woman can get money without it going straight to her husband. So therefore, it's easier to do that according to the rabbis, and that's what Shmuel says. Some people think that he's actually holding by Rabbi Meir, but says as long as the father says the words, I don't want him getting rights to this, that's enough. Okay, so yadi shakiyabala, according to Rabbi Meir, works, but not if you specify, I don't want him having rights to it. So that's a debate. It's a very interesting debate and a very relevant debate, and we'll get to later how the Ron Paskins in the Sugya, and you'll see why it's, it's relevant. So the Ron thinks that Shmuel holds like the rabbis. Okay, it actually comes up on Amud Bed. He says it, um, he says he doesn't disagree with Rav about how to read the Mishnah. He just disagrees with Rav about how to hold. The Mishnah holds like Rabbi Meir, which we're going to see inside in a minute. Shmuel just holds against the Mishnah, like the rabbi's opinion. Another question that's interesting that comes up is, what if after she gains rights to this, however she did it, let's say like Shmuel, where it's a little bit easier, what if she decides to give it to her husband? Let's say, you know, she took it for herself entirely, but then decides to give it to her husband. Is it okay? Because at this point it's her own, and he's not benefiting from her father because it already became into her domain. Or is it really stealing because the father said, don't let your husband use it, and basically she only had partial rights to it, rights only as much as her father let her, and basically it's like she's stealing because she's doing using it for reasons other than what her father specified. It's also just an interesting question. That comes up more in the Achroni. Now we have a question. Matkefla Rabbi Zera. Rabbi Zera comes with a question against Rav, because Rav again has this very, again, whether you say Rav holds like Rabbi Meir and Shmuel holds like the rabbis, or even, and or, or if you say maybe Shmuel just disagrees with how to understand Rabbi Meir, the point is Rav is a very closed definition of Rabbi Meir that you have to be really specific and it has to be what goes in your mouth or something very specific to allow us to override Yadi Shaki Yabala. The whole question is going to be, how easy is it to override that principle or not? So he thinks, Rav says, not at all. To which they say, Rizera questions and says, Kiman az la hashmata de Rav. Okay. First of all, who does Rav hold like? I told you we'd see this inside, even though we already know this. Ki Rabbi Meir, right? Like Rabbi Meir, Damal. Yad Isha ki yabala, right? He says explicitly, a woman's hand is like the husband's hand, which basically means anything that goes to her goes straight to him. Uremenu, but wait, this contradicts the following source. We have a Stam Mishnah, a Mishnah without uh, who said it. A Stam Mishnah we always attribute to Rabbi Meir. So that means that what we're going to read is Rabbi Meir. And this is going to contradict Rav's view of Rabbi Meir. Okay. How do you do shituf mavo? You might remember this from Eruvin. If we live in an alley, a shared alleyway, a bunch of courtyards, and we want to be able to carry, we do a shituf mavo. One of the things you do is you put down some food that has to be equally shared by all the people. So, you can put down a barrel, I guess a barrel full of wine, and omel, harezel chobnea mavo. He says, and this, I'm giving rights to this to everybody in the mavo, but it's not enough to do that. They have to have 
some sort of kinyan, some sort of acquiring. How do we do it? Instead of going to each and every person who lives there, right? It could be a bunch of courtyards with a bunch of people in each courtyard. Instead of having to do that, Mizakelahen, he can give it to someone else and say, I want you to accept rights on behalf of all these people. Kind of like a power of attorney. By who can he do this and by who can't he do it? We'll see. Al yidei avdo v'shivchato ivrim, if he has a Jewish slave or a maidservant, ve'al yidei b'no b'to agdolim, or sons or daughters that are grown, because they have knowledge, right? They can do a kinyan. It has to be someone who can do a kinyan. Ve'al yidei, right, an acquiring, an act of acquiring. Ve'al yidei ishto, and through his wife. Now, i'amart kanayaton bala, if you say anything, the woman acquires, the husband goes right back to him. Well, then, eruv lo nafik mirushute debal. Then this, Barrel that he's giving her rights to for the A roof never left his domain because as soon as it went to her, it went right back to him. So if you're taking this extreme definition of Rabbi Meir, like Rav does, that there's no way Rabbi Meir allows for this, how could he possibly allow it in the Shituf of Old? So Amarava, Apagavda Amar Rabbi Meir, Yadi Shakiyabala. So Rav says, even though he says, right, Rav explains Rabbi Meir is saying, Yadi Shakiyabala, Mode'en, if the father says, I don't want him to have rights to this. He can't override it unless he's very specific about it, right? That only what goes in your mouth. But when it comes to shituf mavod, it's an exception. Why? Because he's trying to give it over to other people. In other words, the first of all, it's in the husband's best interest. He wants to have a way to carry so he's willing, he himself can override it. In our case, it was the father that was trying to override it. That doesn't work. But the husband himself can give the woman rights, okay, just like, okay, the Ron says, he can also, by the way, give her a gift. He can give her a gift and say, I'm giving you a gift. And normally, if she gets a gift of, of a field, this is what we talked about, the Nixim Malog and so on, and I'm not going to get into all the differences between them, but basically, if she gets a field as a gift, he has rights to the payroll, to the proceeds. So... Well, she has rights to the, the, the Karen, he has rights to the proceeds. So now he has rights, if he wants in marriage, to give her a gift and say, I'm giving up my rights to this. He can do that. And then he won't even get the pay road. So just like he could do that in the Shituf Mavu'ot, he can give her rights and say, I'm giving you rights to do this and, and I'm not getting any other rights. So he can override it. But that's not like our Mishnah. Our Mishnah, he wasn't overriding it. It was the father, who her father, who was doing it, right? And... The husband never said, I'm giving up my rights. So that's why it doesn't work in the Mishnah, unless, again, you use this very particular language. But now we have a problem with this. Eitive Ravina la Ravashi. Ravina questions, raises a question to Ravashi, really about Rav's very limited definition of Rabbi Meir. Uh, sorry, who, sorry, who says that, again, it could be, it's, it's really, sorry, the question, according to most of the commentators, is against Rava. Rava just said, that when it comes to shituf mevo'ot, it's not a problem. He can give to her and she can have full rights to do it. The problem is that there's a bright that goes right against this. So the Mishnah seemed to say, yes, it works. And, and the way Rav explained it, you know, it works no problem because he can give her rights. But, and so it's, it's sort of a contradiction within Rabbi Meir himself, but it's also really according to Rav's definition. It says in a bright Elu shezachim lahem, also talking about a shituf mevo'ot, we saw this before, the older children and the servants, the Jewish servants. But notice who's missing here, not the wife. And in fact, we're going to see in a minute, these are the people who can't. And who's that? He can't give them rights to acquire on behalf of other people, for the other people in the Mavoy. Okay, his younger children. His non-Jewish maid servants and maid servants. Why is that? Because they, um, they for sure yad evet ki yad haba. They're property of the father, of the husband, the owner, and therefore anything husband gives to them immediately becomes his. So they can't do this. Vishto and the wife. So what do you see? The wife also, even if he gives up rights, it doesn't work. So how do we resolve that? So Ravashi rejects Rava, really, in his explanation of why it works in Shittu Mavot. Basically, if the husband can override, no, he really can't. Ravashi says, the Mishnah and the Bright are each talking about two different situations. The Mishnah is talking about a case, which again is interesting, because you would think it was rare, but then again, often they 
say the Mishnah is talking about a very unique case, where the woman had her own land that she gained rights to on her own and the husband had no rights to it at all. And in that same alleyway, one house there was hers, and then they had their house that was their, theirs together, and basically he had all the rights to it. So when he gives her rights to be Zochet, Migo de Zachia because on account of the fact that she can gain rights, he's giving it to her to acquire it on behalf of everybody else. Now she can acquire it for herself because she's one of the members of the Mavu, because she owns land there. Therefore, Zachia Lachrine, it works for her to also do it for others. But in a case where she's not a landowner there, it wouldn't work at all. And that's the bright to which it doesn't work versus the Mishnah, and that's how Ravashi resolves it. Okay, new Mishnah, and with this we'll finish for today. Nedel Amanal Gushaya Kumaleha. This is a, the Mishnah quotes a Pasuk from the section about the vows that we've been seeing where the husband and the father can annul the vows. Then says, Neder Amanal Grusha Kol Asher Nafshaya Kumaleha. The vow of a divorcee or a, or a widow. Anything she forbids is going to be valid because there's no one who can undo, nullify her vow. Now the question is, why do you need to say that? It's obvious. She's not married. Of course her husband can't nullify the vow. So why does it tell you this? So Ketzad, they say, what's the scenario? There must be a unique scenario that they would need to tell us this. Otherwise, it's kind of obvious. Oh, before we go, okay, you know what? I'll go back in a minute. Let's just finish this, and then I want to go back. I wanted to tell you something about how we passed in Halacha in the previous sugya. I forgot. So, Ketzad. Amra hareni nizira la'achar shloshimya. She's divorced or widowed, and she says, I'm going to be in nizira in another 30 days. Within those 30 days, the before the neder actually takes effect, even if she gets married within those 30 days, and then when the neder is about to kick in the nizirut, she took the vow on the first of the month. On the 15th of the month, she got married. The vow is only going to take place on the first of the next month. So, and she'll already be married then. So maybe he can nullify it. Comes to teach you, even though she gets married within 30 days and the neder is going to take place, take a, start taking effect then, because she vowed earlier, that is still called what we said earlier, Ein habal mefer bekodmin. He can nullify previous vows. So there you have it. That's what the Pasuk Nedr Amanagusha is teaching you, that even if the neder takes effect while she's married, if she took it when she was divorced, that's really the day it was taken, and that's the where you count it from, and then the husband cannot nullify it. Now, before we finish for today, I wanted to show you how we pass in Allah. If we just do a quick review of what we saw earlier, starting from the, the new Mishnah and Amad Aleph, we saw that if someone forbids the father-in-law and he wants to give something to the daughter, right? We said he could give it as long as he uses this very unique language, according to Rav. And according to Shmuel, he could have just said whatever you want, right? As long as he says, I don't, your father, your husband doesn't have a shoot, he doesn't have, he won't gain possession of this, that's enough. Even if he says, do with it whatever you want. So the Ran, the Ran, talks about how to paskin. And this is just interesting in terms of different methodology about how to paskin halacha. Okay, it's starting with the words ulinyan halacha. Okay, it's the last thing before the next Mishnah, but it's a very long section. I'm only going to read a little bit of it. Pasak hara nagid rabbeinu shmuel alevi b'shem Rav Amram Gaon. Okay, this is a pasak given down from Rav Amram the Gaon. De halacha kishmuel. We hold like shmuel. Why? Well, afa gav de plutayu hacha le'inyan isur. Even though here we're talking about Isul, which is neder, is in the world of Isr Veheter, forbidden and non-forbidden things, like Kashrus is Isr Veheter. Now there's a rule, a general rule, when Rav and Shmuel have an argument, if it's Isur Veheter, we hold like Rav. If it's Din, di, 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 uh, they call it what, di, uh, Dina, okay, which means Dine Mamono, monetary law, we hold like Shmuel. Now here we have something interesting. So he says, why is he hold like Shmuel? This is Yisor Vahater, when it comes to language, language of your vow, and vows in general, right? Whether he can, nullif- whether he can, you know, the, it's the father-in-law taking a vow against the, the son-in-law, and, and then he wants to give this gift to the, the wife. Is it included, you know, how do we deal with this vow? It's Yisor Vahater. But they say, it's not really, because, right, we generally hold like Rav when it comes to Yisulim. But, but really, the basis of the Machloket is this whole thing about Yadi Shaki Yabala, and that's a Dine Mamono. Right? So this is something that covers both territories, but the real, it goes by where the basis of it is. The basis is in, Isor, is in Dine Mamono, financial issues. And that we hold like Shmuel. That's number one. 
Number two, he points out, I'm not going to read this on side, number two, he points out that Rav holds like Rabbi Meir, as the Ran had said, and that Shmuel holds like, everyone agrees that Rav holds like Rabbi Meir. It was this debate whether, and this is why I said it's very relevant. Shmuel holds like the rabbis, then rabbis versus Rabbi Meir. The rabbis are going to win because they're the majority. It's, if we say, and that's what the Ran says, since Shmuel holds like the rabbis, which is consistent with the Ran's opinion, therefore we hold like him. If you hold, though, that Shmuel is not holding like the rabbis, it's just a different interpretation of Rabbi Meir, then already he loses some credibility in terms of posking like him because it's just a matter of what does Rabbi Meir hold. It's not clear, though, that we should hold that way. So anyway, that's uh, some interesting things about how to pasch in halacha. And with that, we'll finish for today. Wishing everyone a Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Tov, meet up on Sunday. And register for the CM if you haven't registered yet. We're almost, almost there. Recording stop.